born in 1925, youngest of four children, two sisters and a brother. He had a normal childhood at times here. Went to a parochial school. From parochial school, I went to a Calvert Hall High School. And I'm getting very fast. <laughs> I graduated on June the 6th. In July the 1st, I enlisted in the Navy. And August 28th of 1943, uh, I was assigned to a ship. And I stayed for USS Arkansas, stayed in that ship for the length of the war. The war, we, our home port was on the East Coast, was New York City. It was, I spent very time in New York City with uh, some of the fellow uh, sailors. Uh, as far as action is concerned, we did convoy duty in the North Atlantic, six trips. Seventh convoy we took over, we were informed that there would be no overnight liberty. So I guess most of us figure something big was going to happen. And two days later, when we were anchored out, you never uh, wasn't any piers to tie up the ship, had to anchor out in Bangor Bay. <clears throat> and two days later, the USS New York came in. And two days after that, the Nevada came in. And we knew, sure, sure in heaven, something's going to happen, because usually we just unloaded the, um, the ships down to the uh, Liverpool, and we, we came back home for another cruise. <laughs> and then World War, then came the invasion of Normandy on June the 6th. And we were there for 13 days. And I was on an anti-aircraft battery, so we were basically spectators because we had no return fires from us, no... Uh, aircraft activity or anything like that, and it was just uh, a normal run of the day for us, except for the 12-inch uh, guns, you know, rocking a ship muscle when they would uh, fire around. The war was a, I don't talk much about the war, man, mm. but just a lot of the funniest that when we were at Normandy, and we had air alert, which means half the battery, half the and the aircraft battery could go below decks and get a sandwich and coffee and take a shower, but no washing clothes stuff across the evaporator and stuff. And then they would blow uh, air alert, we'd have to all go up there. But one plane, an American plane, was shot down close to our ship and they lowered the captain's jig, which is a powered motor, uh, to pick up the bodies. And being such a large ship, they happen to have a, uh, un what do you call it, undertaker on board or film. Mm -hmm. So they wrapped them in canvas and they laid them on the deck in compartment number three, which was right next to compartment number one. In the army, they call them uh, barracks, we call them compartments. And we had this one guy, he could sleep on a pin. His name was Arnold from somewhere in Indiana. And we were all sleeping in general order, uh, general quarter blue, so we had to get get up and shot from to our battle stations. <laughs> we told Arnold, "Go to wake those two guys up in the corner." <laughs> but I mean, it was funny at that time, was but I was very we should, should it. <laughs> when you come because we're all young kids, right? Nineteen wasn't I wasn't drive behind ears yet. <laughs> Over to uh, Bangor Bay in Ireland, Northern Ireland, you had to go to, you going to Liberty, you go, go ashore, you had to get on, they call a drifter, which we call down here as a tugboat, right? And you go ashore, and you could stay overnight because the USO had facilities where you paid 50 cents, you get a bed for the night, you take care of it right away. And you couldn't get 
cold beer over in the day. It was for them. So we got a hold of some old Bushmills, which is an Irish whiskey. And we drank it. We went to sleep that night. We got up feeling pretty hazy in the morning. And on our way down to the docks to get the, to get the drifter back, there was a, delivery, a milk delivery van. So we bought some milk from them. Again, it was warm milk, but it was goat's milk. <laughs> Didn't know at that time. <laughs> and, I sat at the end of that drifter and I threw up from the time I think it was the time I got there. <laughs> and that's the last time <laughs> I got drunk. And I very rarely since that time would uh, drink any kind of hard liquor. I was sick for a day. And the funny part about it was good. I was in Percy for a while, for a long while. And this one guy did business with us all of a sudden. I told him that story, and for about three years in a row, he sent me two, two bottles of old Bushmills, a little square bottle. <laughs> I came away. I <laughs> and then we came home to Boston this time for a long period, and they had to re rifle the guns and stuff like that. And, do a lot of work in the engine room. And we all were, the, all the enlisted people were saying, well, we're not going to send this old battleship over to, into uh, the Pacific. But to our surprise, Missouri had just, the newest crew, uh, had just sent our shakedown crews, and she was heading to the West Coast via the Panama Canal, and we followed her, and as normal for an old ship, we broke down. We stayed overnight in, in the Blake, and we were granted, our division was granted uh, liberty, which had to be back by 12 o'clock. So I wasn't going to get a set of weights dirty just to go out ashore for a couple hours, which I stayed in. And a little interesting story there, the Marines have a detachment on ships, and their main duty enlisted man is the captain's orderly. He wants a cup of coffee or do this. Have to stand outside of his office. He walks from his office to the bridge. They gotta be, they gotta stand so many feet near him and stuff like that. And one of the guys, I Irish guy, was named McGallan, Miss Ship. <laughs> He's probably still on a break. <laughs> Wish he shipped on war time, though. Big deal. Then we went up to, uh, after, said we had broke down and made some minor repairs while on the uh, lake. Then went up to Long Beach, California and did some more yard work and then we joined them. We joined the 5th Fleet, I think the 7th Fleet was the big fleet out there. The older ships was the 5th Fleet. And uh, went to the invasion of Iko, uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. That's a very interesting story. Hiroshima was only about seven miles long, about the size of Ocean City. The Japanese only had one aircraft on there, but they had a lot of troops. And I was on any aircraft. So when you're on any aircraft batteries, you're top side. You're not underneath in the turrets and stuff like that, trips taking off them, uh, or down in the engine room keeping the stuff moving. And I fortunately on I was on what they called a forty millimeter gun, which was they called the pom pom guns, with four barrel guns. And I was the trainer. That was a you had a wheel on one side and a pointer wheel on the other side. He had a wheel in case the automatic uh, sights went out. You could, be, you could do it manually, but that was uh, untold of. And I, being deemed a trainer, I had glasses, so I really and truthfully, a lot of us saw the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. And I was one of them, but, but didn't think of anything of it at that time. And another interesting thing about the, at the Oak, we, had no any aircraft, no uh, air, enemy aircraft at Iwo Jima. But that Sunday afternoon at Okinawa, the American Navy knocked out 231 kamikazes out of the air. And that time, I guess everybody knew 
Yeah, they were always pretty daggone close. So I had a full course of uh, combat duty in the uh, thing. I know nothing bad about that. My ship never got hit. But I had to projectiles fly over the ship or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I guess we were lucky. Then we came back to the States and everybody got discharged and stuff like that. So I came home and I was in February of 46 and just to continue my normal life. And then that September I started uh, night school and accounting, and accounting. And that took me five years because uh, we got married in uh, November of '47. Yeah, kind of mixed. I was, let's see, let's see uh, I was, I was 21. And I was home about two weeks and said, hey, no, <laughs> "This is it. I got to get a job." <laughs> so I got, got a job, and I, that, that was that was it. My first job was with Crown, Crown Court Concealed Infantry Patrol Department. Right. Then I left them and went to Martin's for a while. Then I worked for. Uh, Proctor Silex for a couple of years, and then I went with this small, this mid-sized machine shop for 25 years out of Isertown Road, ASC Corporation, since now closed. Worked all my life in Perch. Uh, oh, I did get my degree in accounting, ABA in accounting, but I never practiced it. I got interested in purchasing, so I stayed in the purchasing function in the corporate field. I met Miriam before. Uh, when I was in uh, was 16 in high school through a friend of mine by the name of Hunter. And, uh, and she was uh, same 16 also. We were both born in, in, the, in, the, in the 1925. And I went away in the service and came back. We got engaged uh, on the Christmas hours in 46 and got married in uh, November of uh, 47. And just normal married life, and uh, we didn't have children until 1951. I think we were about three. We were married about three and a half years before Mary Mark was born, and then uh, we had a few more after that. And Timmy was the youngest. And when the kids were small, in between we came down Ocean City. We've been coming down Ocean City, I know, for over 60 years rent an apartment and stuff for one week uh, and we finally bought a place down here and when Timmy was 30 so that would have been I came out of the year and we had really enjoyed it and some people don't like Oakshire City but <laughs> we think it's great and, and uh, Timmy Unfortunately, got sick in 1997, and 97 was a bad year. I buried uh, brother-in-laws and settlers and stuff like that, and cousins and aunts. And then uh, uh, Timmy got to get sick in May of 1998, and I mean 1997, he got sick. He was sick for about a year and a half before he passed away. And I think that was down, beginning of Miriam's slowing down a little bit. It knocked the stars out. It's fortunate that the last as long was in halfway decent health. And my marriage lasted 63 years. And the kids are all doing well. The, the one big disappointment was Timmy passing away early. Other than that, we, we know that uh, one of us, uh, we have to go first, like uh, we used to kid Miriam all the time. I said, the law of averages says there's more widows in this world than there are widowers, and uh, that I'm going to go first. And her reply to me, we say, if you do, I'll kill you. <laughs> so uh, she always wanted to go first. So Because my father has a, from a big family, and we're never close to my father's family. And my mother's family all, they lived in Philadelphia. 
Anyway, so I say my father, but my father was a real quiet and unassuming kind of person. He stayed in the background most of the time. So I'm probably where I get some of that, that uh, stay in the back and not give an opinion unless I ask of it, unless they ask me. Uh, a little bit, I, my family wasn't, I, I didn't have any troubles with my brother. My, my one sister died early, and the one sister I was very familiar uh, with, but uh, our family never hugged and kissed like the other families, you know, that's, so that's kind of a little leery with me. <laughs> and I've overcome that, and I show more um, activity to my children than my father did. Real confidence that uh, if uh, I like to see Matthew and uh, my and Melissa and Aaron and stuff like that and talk to them from time to time, if they ask me for any advice, then I can give it to them. I would. Unfortunately, nowadays it's, uh, it's so much available that they can get their information from that that's. Uh, that father and son stuff uh, went out the window, I believe, <laughs> some time ago. Best moments, I mean, as far as life, you've got a, you, you know, your courtship of your wife, your marriage, and the uh, birth of your four children, and seeing them grow up and go through school or to high school, and then they, some of them married, and, and they had then the birth of grandchildren, and then we come along, we get this little, Ellie was a great grandchild and she's just a, a real joy. I'm just amazed how well she talked for a two and a half year old. Mm -hmm. It's just, a, and what amazes me, she, <laughs> she very rarely walks, she's always running, but you know, she's always going to be running. And it's, it's a pleasure, it's just showing up, just, uh, I won't, I won't pick her up when I'm standing up because I'm afraid I'll fall. But uh, when I'm sitting down, I'll pick her up. But all grandchildren, great grand grandchildren, are a joy, and great grandchildren are even a, are a joy too. Just go to school, do the best you can, and just be honest with everybody. And when you go out in the work field, do your do do your work and don't complain. You keep smiling. You got to you got to discuss it with your parents or someone that you know could give you advice on how to handle it. My one grand niece said she's around twelve now, and she said uh, she don't like anybody a hundred years old, but Uncle Herman's the closest, so I'm rooting for him. <laughs> I said, stop rooting. <laughs> I still stay in contact with my, one of my uh, schoolmates. His name was Vic Dubay. He lives in Detroit. We corresponds about uh, twice a year, a letter, and at, and at Christmas. And uh, I keep in contact with the people, uh, my friends up in Baltimore from church, uh, my car players up there, and some friends, and things along that line. I just had a, just a normal life and nothing to, to really say anything. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough that I didn't have any real bad illnesses. Uh, most of my stuff was minor stuff except for uh, knee replacements. And I just enjoyed life and I enjoy sports. I played sports and I enjoy watching sports more than I do watching uh, some kind of uh, mystery show on television. Well, I played uh, softball a lot in the because of, I was only a, uh, from my back door to Patterson Park, I was probably took me less than a half a minute to get to Patterson Park, and I played soccer for four years at uh, Cowboy Hall, and, but I never, and did space some uh, Paul, when I was in my 20s, but uh, when we got married, we decided to uh, allow me to get hurt and break a leg or something, so we stopped playing sports then. <laughs> my father and the babe were second cousins. 
but as you know, Babe Ruth was named George Herman, but I wasn't named after Babe Ruth because I'm a junior. My father's name was Herman. And that's a little interesting story there too. I'm the youngest boy, but I got junior. And how that happened when my mother was carrying my one brother, those days they didn't know what the baby was going to be. And my maternal grandmother was on her deathbed and she asked if a, it was a boy to name it Harry, after her, one of our sons that she lost. So it's an interesting story from my viewpoint, <laughs> but not from anybody else. My father met him once. And, uh, well, Babe Ruth's heyday was over when I started. His heyday was in the late 20s and early 30s, and I didn't start following baseball and stuff until I was, uh, you know, 10, 11 years old, which would be about in the late 30s. So yeah. I feel very, very fortunate that my children took care of my wife and I. Because sometimes you hear, uh, People don't. I, think that. I guess that little will be coming over shortly, so you better get this gear together. <laughs> or she'll want to get in on it. 